Hello everyone, I'm thrilled to be able to join you in this pre-recorded format to celebrate the task force that has produced this tremendous report, Winning in Asia, Creating Long-Term Value. I'm disappointed though that I'm unable to join you in person. That's because today, as you launch this report, I'll be in regional South Australia. Interestingly, both the location that I'm in and the means with which we're communicating has some resonance in relation to the report. I'll be in Sejuna and Port Lincoln at the time of the launch, here in South Australia, and I'll be there partly to see the export markets of premium Australian seafood that is destined for markets across particularly Asia, emphasising the link between some of the most remote parts of Australia and our Asian markets that are so increasingly important. But also in terms of the means, I'm joining you virtually, which as we all know is a sign of the times for us all right now but it does also emphasise the increasing importance of digital, of digital communications, of digital trade, and the areas that I know we'll be exploring more of. Our government's priority since the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic has firstly been to protect the health of all Australians. And I thank many of you who've made sacrifices to help us in that regard. But our second priority has been to protect Australia's economy along with the jobs and the productive base of business that are so important to our future. Our mind is now firmly fixed on how we also create a platform for Australia's long-term economic performance to grow our way out of the challenges we now face, to create further jobs, prosperity, and of course, to deal with the debt repayments we will face in future years. Asia has a major, a crucial role to play here. Despite the shocks of COVID-19, Asia will continue to be a major source of economic potential for the world and especially for Australia. I want to make three key points in the launch of this report today. Firstly, that our government has worked hard and continues to create the business platform for business engagement in Asia. We encourage and support engagement of Australian businesses across Asia as we do across the world. We now have some 14 free trade agreements in place, covering 20 different partners and markets. And 10 of those agreements focus on partners and markets in Asia. This includes bilateral strategies with key partners in the region, including China, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, and our ASEAN partners as a whole. Our partnership with Indonesia, long awaited and long fought for and worked for, came into force on the 5th of July. And only last week, I was excited to sign a landmark digital economy agreement with Singapore. One that I expect will be the first of many and one that is part of a key partnership between Australia and Singapore to demonstrate openness and reform in digital economy and e-commerce around the world. I would encourage all Australian businesses looking to invest in Asia to take advantage of the access we have secured through these free trade agreements. Our government has opened the doors for business to trade and to get preferential terms and access to trade across our region and the world. But business needs to choose to walk through those doors and to be informed about how they do it to ensure they succeed. There is of course a real incentive for business to go offshore. And that's my second key point. The case seems clear as this report suggests. Revenue growth is faster in companies with some offshore elements. Evidence suggests that larger, internationally diversified ASX 200 companies create more value for shareholders than ASX 200 companies that are domestically focused. We know that those companies deliver better benefits to their employees, faster growth, and of course, ultimately, greater benefits to the nation as a whole. I encourage businesses to work with our Austrade and DFAT teams as they look to explore opportunities for growth and diversification. Businesses should see the diplomatic network as a resource, including a resource for market intelligence in overseas markets. We made this utilisation of our diplomatic network a clear priority in the foreign policy white paper Economic diplomacy is at the core of what we expect all our agencies offshore to deliver upon, and you should feel free to engage them in that mission. 
Of course, the third point is that there are clearly lessons to be learned. That's a lifelong process for all of us. Australian businesses have had major successes in Asia, a long history of engagement now with the region, but we can always do better. I commend the report's comprehensive strategic approach to outlining how to win in Asia. The 14 strategies identified are relevant to business, to government, to intermediaries, to peak bodies, business councils and industry groups. It provides a roadmap for us all to work collaboratively to increase the dividends from working with Asia. Can I recognise first the sponsoring organisations and thank those who have given their time. Asia Link Business, the National Centre for Asia Capability, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia and the Sid and Fiona Meyer Family Foundation and also particularly the 11 preeminent Australian business leaders who comprise the task force and have very much made this a report by business for business. Best wishes to you all for a successful launch, but even more importantly, great success in implementing this report, its recommendations, working together as business with government to deliver the greatest possible success for our nation in the future. Thanks so very much.